praise Allah. We praise Him seeking His help and His guidance. And we seek refuge in Allah from the evil of ourselves and the consequence of our wrong actions. Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah wahdahu la sharika lah. Lahu al-mulku wa lahu al-hamd wa huwa ala kulli shay'in qadir. Wa ashhadu anna sayyidina wa 'azimina wa habibina wa qa'idina wa qurrata a'yunina Muhammadan 'abduhu wa rasuluhu wa safiyyuhu wa habibuhu wa khaliluhu. And I testify that there is no God except Allah, alone with no partner. He is His is the dominion, dominion, and praise belongs to Him, and He has full ability over everything. And I testify that our Sayyid and beloved and leader and coolness of our eyes, Muhammad, is His slave and messenger, and His chosen, His beloved, and His intimate friend. Allahumma salli ala Sayyidina Muhammad in Abdika Rasulika and Nabi al Ummi, wa ala Ali Sayyidina Muhammad, wa as Wajihi wa Zuriyati, Kama Sulayta ala Ibrahim, wa ala Ali Ibrahim, wa Barak ala Sayyidina Muhammad, Abdika Rasulik, and Nabi al Ummi, wa ala Ali Sayyidina Muhammad, wa as Wajihi wa Zuriyati, Kama Barakta ala Sayyidina Ibrahim, wa ala Ali Sayyidina Ibrahim, from Alameen in Naka Hamid al Majid. We ask Allah to bestow on the Prophet وسلم, the most salient and communicative benedictions and upon his family and companions on all of the righteous successors. To commence, I remind myself and you all of the importance of taqwa of Allah. Call Allah Ta'ala, Ya ayyuhalladheena amanu taqwa Allah haqqa tuqatihi. وَلَا تَمُوتُنَّ إِلَّا وَأَنْتُمْ مُسْلِمُونَ Allah Most High says, O oh, you who believe, have taqwa, reverent fear, consciousness of Allah, with a taqwa due to Him, and do not die except as Muslims. And Allah says, وَقَالَ تَعَالَى يَا أَيُّهَا الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا اتَّقُوا اللَّهَ وَقُولُوا قَوْلًا سَدِيدًا يُسْلِحْ لَكُمْ أَعْمَالَكُمْ وَيَغْفِرْ لَكُمْ ذُنُوبَكُمْ وَمَا يُتِعِ اللَّهَ وَرَسُولَهُ Believers, O oh you who believe, have taqwa of Allah and speak words which hit the mark. He will put your right actions right for you and forgive you your wrong deeds. All who obey Allah and His Messenger have won a mighty victory. Alhamdulillah. We thank Allah, we praise Allah. And I want to focus on one aspect. Something that's very interesting when you look at the Prophet ﷺ, his biography and some incidents in his life. One time the Prophet ﷺ, he came home and his wife Aisha, she received a gift. She received a gift of meat, a full lamb, a full, full portion of meat. And his wife Aisha was a lady of virtue. And she gave all of that meat in charity. And that shows you the status of the Prophet's family, is that they were people of virtue. And she gave all of that meat in charity, except for the shoulder piece of that meat, because she knew that the Prophet ﷺ liked that piece. So she saved it for him. And when the Prophet ﷺ came home, he asked her, or she told him rather, that we had this gift and I gave it all in charity except that I saved a shoulder piece of meat for you so she said that the charity is gone except for this shoulder piece of meat and the Prophet ﷺ, he said something amazing he said that no it's the opposite is that the only thing that remains the, 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 whole, the, the lamb remains and the only thing that's gone is the shoulder piece of meat in other, in other words is your charity is what remains and, and what you hold back, that's, that's what doesn't, that's, that's what, that's, it doesn't remain. But the point that I want to mention here, or the point that I want to focus on here, is that the Prophet ﷺ, he was teaching us how do we view the world. He was teaching us how we see things. He was teaching us to view the world through a prophetic lens. Is that many of us, we act as Muslims, but do we see the world as Muslims? Do we see the world through the light of La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah? Do we see the world through these lens? These are the prophetic lens. When Na'udhu Billah, some people, they see the world, they act as Muslims or they say they're Muslims, but the way that they see the world is very materialistic. Or the way that they see the world is not in accordance to the way that the Prophet he saw the world. 
And that's an important aspect of having the correct perspective. So with that in mind, I want to look at another report from the Prophet ﷺ where one of his companions came to him and he posed a question, a very interesting question. And he came to the Prophet ﷺ and he, it's a beautiful question. He said, Oh Messenger of Allah, what is the best act that I can do? What's the most important act? What is the, in other words, in looking at the world through the way that Allah and His Messenger has taught us to look at the world, What's the most important thing that you can do? Right? And the Prophet ﷺ, in response to this, he said that it is to pray the prayer in its correct times. It is to pray the prayer in its correct times. So I wanted to focus, or I want to focus on the importance of the prayer and talking about the prayer, because it's the essence of what it means to be Muslim. And when this prophet, when the prophet said, he gave this response, he says to pray the prayer in his best times. So and some people they might think, or especially nowadays, we might say, is that enough? Right? Sometimes when we see what happens in the world, all the calamities and the things that unfortunate incidences, we think sometimes, is it just enough to pray? Is it just enough to make du'a? Right? Just make sometimes people they give you the advice, make du'a. And it might come to your heart, or some people might think, is that enough? Right? To pray. And the answer to that is clear because Allah says in Surah Baqarah, He says, Seek assistance in, in sabr, in fortitude, and the prayer. And in another verse, in Surah Al Yunus, where Allah talks about the struggle that went on between Musa and Harun and Fir'aun and the Pharaoh and the Fir'aunic system, where Musa and Harun they were sent to face this. Really, a tyrannic, it's really a tyrannical government. These two people were faced; to, to, they were sent to face one of the greatest tyr tyrants in the face of this earth by themselves. So Allah says about this in their struggle in Surah Yunus: is that Allah says, "We reveal to Musa and his brother, settle your people in houses in Egypt, and make your houses places of worship, establish the salah, and give good news to the believers." Establish the salah and give good news to the believers. In other words, any activism or any positions that we can take that's devoid of spirituality, that's devoid of having patience, that's devoid of connecting to, to Allah, that's devoid of salah, is that that can never be truly fruitful and that can never be what Allah wants from us. Is that whatever we do, it has to be connected to these meanings of the prayer and to these meanings of connecting to Allah. And the prayer itself, we can look at it from one aspect, is that it has a body. From one aspect the prayer has a body, and that's the physical aspect of the prayer, right? The ruku', the sujood, the qiyam, the qira'ah. The physical aspect of the prayer is as if it's the body of the prayer. But a body isn't valuable without a soul. So the prayer also has a soul, there's a quote, if you wish, there's a soul to the prayer. And the soul to the prayer, which is often forget, for, forgotten, is praying the prayer with presence, with concentration, with meanings, and with these words called khushur and khudur. These words that are common, we, free, we know them, but what do they truly mean, khushur and khudur? These words, khushur and khudur, can be roughly translated as humbleness and submissiveness. They say the difference between khushur and khudur is that khushur is outward, it's an outward stillness and it's an outward humility that a person has that you can see that he's praying with concentration and you can see that he's praying a meaningful prayer. And khudur is the inward reality of that prayer. It's experiencing the meanings of that prayer. The scholars of the heart, they mention that this quality of khushur and khudur it has six components or you can say there's six stages in this meaning of khushur and khudur or humility and submissiveness is that the first is that a person has presence of heart so when we stand to pray we bring a heart we feel the greatness of the one that we're standing before we have presence of heart and the prayer is an address from Allah. It's like He's calling you. And if you come to someone who addresses you, 
and your mind is distracted, is that that's not acceptable. So the first step in khushu' and khudur is to have presence of heart. Follow, following presence of heart is to have understanding of the meaning of what we're doing and what we're saying. So it's two things. We should understand what we're doing, what we're responding towards the call of Allah. When we place rukur, we're bowing before Allah. When we place our heads on the floor, we're prostrating before Allah. Think about that. Just think about the fact that we are people who put our heads on the floor before Allah. Right? You don't find people, nowadays people don't worship, they don't worship like this. You don't find, it's very, find very rarely you find someone that puts his head on the floor and worships Allah. We have to be conscious of what we're doing. The whole essence of having khushu and khudur is not making, not going on autopilot in our prayer. The whole essence of having khushu and khudur is getting out of autopilot where we just kind of get up, we don't even think about what we're doing, up, down, touch the ground, back up. Is that the whole essence of this is not having, is not having, is, is having khushur. So being conscious of what we're doing and what we're saying. Is that when we say Bismillahirrahmanirrahim, these, not, these, not, these shouldn't be words that we just say and we don't think about. You're saying in the name of Allah, the most merciful, the all compassionate, the most merciful, the all merciful. When we say Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen, we should feel that meaning when we say that. We shouldn't take these words for granted. These are words that if they were placed on mountains, those mountains would completely crumble. And they say about that verse, they say about that is that Allah says that this Quran if you was to place it on a mountain you would see it rend asunder and crumble by the khashya, by the fear of Allah and they say there's three meanings with regards to that the first is that that tells you the greatness of these words that tells you the greatness of the Quran because if the Quran is so weighty that it could be placed on a mountain and that mountain will crumble and what do you think about those words? Second, that also tells you the strength and the greatness of the Prophet Sallallahu heart because if the Prophet Sallallahu can withhold and he can receive that message what type of heart do you think, how strong do you think that heart is is that mountains would crumble but that also is also a third component to that verse is that that tells us about our own states because if these are words that can crumble mountains and we read them, and we don't feel anything, then is our heart harder than mountains? Is our heart harder than stones? So these are things that we have to reflect upon. So the second meaning of khushur is understanding what we're saying. And that's why it's important, if someone can't study Arabic, then they can at least learn the equivalent to the, they can at least learn the equivalent in their own language, in English, or whatever language they speak, to the words in Arabic. When you say, Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen, all praise be to Allah, Lord of existence. Right? Lord of Alameen, everything that exists. That means that every single atom in existence is praising Allah. Every single universe from the macroverse to the microverse to everything in between is in the state of praise of Allah. And that we should know these meanings. So the first step in attaining khushur is having presence of heart. The second step is understanding what we're doing and what we're saying. The third step, which is getting more subtle, is having reverence, having fear, having awe. Because somebody can understand the meanings, but they understand it in a way that's devoid of awe or respect. Just like a child, you can tell him something, he understands it, but he doesn't take it serious. Right? So the next step is having fear in your heart, having khashya. And this word khashya, it's different than fear. Because fear, you might have fear of an animal, or you might have fear of a certain situation, but khashya is a reverential fear. When you see, for example, the sun, and you understand how great the sun is, and how amazing these things are, or you see a tornado, or you see something like that that's amazing, something from the natural elements, is that it scares you, and it scares you because you realize how powerful it is. So it's not just you're scared, but it's reverential fear. So the next step in attaining khushur is having that reverential reverential fear and followed by fear in attaining khushur and khudur humbleness and submissiveness is having awe which is again, these are getting subtle they're, they're, they're closely related but they're slightly different so having awe is, is, is related to having reverence and magnification 
And then followed by having a ah, is having hope for acceptance and having hope for nearness and having reward. Right? So it's not just having fear, you don't want to have but it's, it's fear and hope coupled together. Fear and hope coupled together. So you have hope that Allah accepts that prayer. You have hope that that prayer brings you nearer to Allah, and you have hope that that prayer gives you rewards with Allah. And finally, the last component of khashya, the scholars mentioned the six components, is that you have shame, and that you have a feeling of embarrassment, and you have a feeling of humility, that you feel that I was not able to fulfill the right of this prayer. And that's why you'll find that after we finish the prayer, what do we say? We say, Astaghfirullah, Astaghfirullah, Astaghfirullah. Why do we say Astaghfirullah? We didn't commit anything sinful, but the prayer has a haq, the prayer has a right, the prayer has a standard, and when we don't meet that standard, we should feel embarrassed, or we should feel at least somewhat broken-hearted that we didn't fulfill that standard. So these are the six components of khashi and khushur, and these are the, this is the soul of the prayer, and that this is the hadith, there's a report that mentions that one of the first things that's taken from this ummah is the khushur and the khashya from the prayer. There's another hadith that mentions that there's going to come a time where the masjids are beautiful and they're adorned and they're wonderful, but there's no guidance in that masjid. Is that what is one of the things that if you think about the salaf and you think about the companions and you think about the Prophet's time, what is one of those, what, is, what, what distinguishes them? There's a multiple, there's, 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 a multiple, there's multiple things that distinguish them, but one of them, without a doubt, is the way that they pray. The way that they pray, the concentration, and the khashya and the khushur when they pray. Is that the prayer was the most essential thing in their life, and that this is what we have to strive for, and this is what we have to attempt in achieving. And I want to look briefly, and take a quick glimpse at how some of the righteous people, how they pray. And obviously, the most righteous of all is the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam. And there's a hadith that Aisha she says that when the she the Prophet they asked she she was asked how was the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam in his house, and she responded that he was like a normal man. He was with us. He laughed when we laughed, and he was with us. Except that she said when the time for prayer came, it was as if we didn't know him and he didn't know us is that he went in a complete state that was completely different and it was as if, his own wife is saying, it is as if we didn't know him and he didn't know us. And that was the Prophet Wasallam's state when he would hear the call to prayer. And if you look at Sayyidina Ali radiallahu anhu, is they say that whenever the Adhan was called, Sayyidina Ali, his, the color of his face would change. His face would change and he would turn pale. Whenever he heard the adhan, imagine you're with somebody that they hear the adhan and their state changes. We never, probably never even seen this before, but this is real. Sayyidina Ali, his face would change and he would turn pale. And they asked him about this, and what did he say? He said that this is the call to the trust which Allah has given human beings, and that this is the trust in the verse where Allah says that if he was to give, he offered the trust to the heavens and the earth, and they refused to take the trust. But this is the trust. Praying the salah is the trust. It's the amana. And he knew the weightiness of this trust. So his face would turn pale and he would change. Ibn Abbas, عنه, he said a statement. He said two raka'ats, two units of prayer. Prayed with full concentration and full devotion. He said that's better than praying a whole night of prayer without any contemplation or reflection or devotion. Two raka'ats prayed with concentration and khushu' and khudur is better than praying the whole night without any meaning, without experience, with heedlessness. One of the righteous predecessors, his name was Muslim bin Yasser, is that when he was going to pray, he would say to his family, he would say, continue talking, continue playing, because I can't even hear you when I pray. He says, don't worry about it, don't worry about lowering your voice, I can't even hear you when I pray. And that this same man, he was once in Basra in Iraq, and in the masjid, the wall collapsed. Boom, the wall collapsed. Everyone was in commotion, everyone was running around, everyone was in commotion. And he was praying, and he didn't even notice that the wall collapsed. Because he was so engrossed in his prayer, that he didn't even feel anything until after his prayer ended. Another, one of the righteous salihin, his name was Amr bin Abdullah, similar state. Is that he said that his daughter used to play the tambourine, she used to dance, she used to play. And he didn't, he didn't experience it. He, didn't, he, he wasn't even conscious of it due to his prayer. 
And one time, that same uh, Imam, that same that same that same pious person, is that he had an arm, the gangaritis, his arm was rotting, and they actually had to amputate it. But they didn't. They couldn't amputate it. So what they did is they talked to his friends. They spoke to his friends, and his friends said, "Wait till he's praying, because when he prays, he doesn't feel anything. Wait till he's praying, because when he prays, he doesn't feel anything." So they actually amputated his arm while he was praying, and he didn't feel it until after the salat. These sound like fables, but these are true stories. These are true stories, right? People enter states that they're so focused and they're so concentrated that they're not aware of anything outside of them. And that this is this is the essence of the khushur and the khudur. One of them said, one of the scholars said that the prayer itself, the salat, it actually doesn't belong to this world. It belongs to the akhirah. It's from the actions of the akhirah, the next world. So when you enter the prayer, exit this world and enter into akhirah. Right? One of them said, one, one of them said, in Hatim al Asam, they asked him about his prayer. And they asked him to describe how, how, what's his experience of the salah like? And then he said, he said, when the time comes, right, I complete my wudu and I go to the place of prayer. So before the adhan, when the time comes in, he does wudu and he sits in that place. He says, I sit there and, until my limbs become at rest. Then I rise for the prayer, placing the qibla, the Kaaba before me, the bridgeway under my feet, the sirat to be underneath my feet. I put the garden Jannah to my right and hellfire to my left. I put the angel of death behind me and I consider this to be the last prayer. I then stand between fear and hope. I say Allahu Akbar. I bow with humility and prostrate with lowliness. And finally, I know not whether this prayer is accepted or not. That this is the state and this is what we have to. We have to strive to achieve the state of khushur and khudur and to make our prayers not just routines but things that transform our lives. Is that the, Allah says in the, in the Quran, in the Salat, that uh, Allah says that, in, that the Quran, that, that, that the Salat, it prevents from indecency and wrong actions. So in other words, we don't just pray the Salat and it has no effect on our lives. Rather, the Salat is supposed to impact every aspect of our lives. Someone who's truly righteous is that you can see the effects of their salah that they pray throughout their day. You can see it on their face. You can see it in the way that they speak. You can see it in the way that they act. You can see it in the way that they act with their elders. You can see it with the way that they act with, their young, with the youngsters. You can see the impact of their salah on their life because their salah transforms their life. And when they pray the prayer like how we described with these righteous, pious people, is that that's how our estate will be. May Allah give us tawfiq in that. May Allah make it easy for with us. And may Allah facilitate that for us. Allah Azza wa Jalla yaqul wa bikawli yahdi al-muhdadeen jalla fi ulaad wa idha kurya al-Qur'an fastabiru lahu wa ansitu wa ansitu la'allakum la'allakum tuhamun wa qala Azza bin Qa'il al-Kareem fa idha kura'at al-Qur'an fasa'id billahi bin al-Shaytan al-Rajim a'udhu billahi bin al-Shaytan al-Rajim bismillahi rahman rahim والعصر إن الإنسان لفي خصم إلا الذين آمنوا وعملوا الصالحات وتواصوا بالحق وتواصوا بالصبر. الحمد لله رب العالمين. وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له ولي الصالحين وأشهد أن سيدنا محمد عبده ورسوله قائد الغور المحجنين إلى جنات النعيم صلى الله وسلم عليه وعلى آله وصحبه حق قدره ومقداره العظيم وأن معهم وفيهم برحمتك يا أرحم الراحمين. So as we've been discussing that the prayer it's obviously foundational to the life of the believer and it's something that we have to work on and something that we have to develop and something that we have to cultivate. And the prayer itself or the acts of worship, you can look at them from three perspectives or there's three aspects of every act of worship. There's the outward aspect of the, of the act of worship, then there's 
as we mentioned, then there's the spiritual or the essence or the soul of that act of worship. And then there's something called the maqasid or the higher objective or the purpose of that act of worship. And as we mentioned, the outward aspect of the prayer is the bowing, the prostration, and so on and so forth, the recitation. And we learn about this outward aspect in the books of fiqh. Is that it's really important to perfect the outward actions of the prayer because we will never reach the inward reality of the prayer if we're not praying the prayer correctly. So the prayer has certain rules and guidelines that must be respected. And we have to learn this no matter male or female or whatever occupation that we have because we have to find people who are qualified to teach us how to pray correctly. And it's not sufficient just to do it how we think is that we actually have to learn how to pray cor correctly. And a lot of people, they make mistakes. Sometimes or often they make mistakes in their prayer without knowing. For example, a common mistake that people make, which is, is, is a big mistake, is that when they stand for the prayer, they just raise their hands and they don't say Allahu Akbar. Is that what actually commences the prayer is saying the takbirat al-ihram. You have to say Allahu Akbar. Raising your hands is one thing. Sunnah, it's, you're supposed to raise your hands, but what actually commences the prayer is saying Allahu Akbar. And that, re that, regard, that relates to the outward aspect of the prayer, and that's important to know. Another common mistake that sometimes people do is that when you do sujood, when you prostrate, is that your feet have to be, have to be bent. You don't, you don't just put our, put our feet on the uh, flat, they have to be bent towards it. Because your feet, that's the portion of their sujood, is that you bend your feet, your toes, sorry, not your feet, your toes, towards the, the, the qibla, the right direction. So these are aspects of the outward dimension of the prayer that must be learned and they must be perfected. And then we went on to mention the inward aspects of the prayer, the khushur and the khudur. And I just want to mention briefly some practical steps that we can take in attaining the khushur and the khudur that's composed of those six levels that we mentioned. The first thing is to have presence of heart when we perform wudu. Is that we have to realize that Performing wudu is actually an act of worship. It's not just getting yourself wet with water, but it's actually an act of worship. So when you perform the wudu, you have to perform the wudu with ihsan. And if you look at the hadith where the Prophet ﷺ talks about those who perform the wudu, you, won't, you will see that it doesn't just say they perform the wudu, but they say ahsana wudu ahu. They say that they perform the wudu with excellence. One time Imam al-Shafi'i, when he passed away, one of the righteous ladies of his time, Sayyidina Nafisa of Egypt, when she heard the news that Imam al-Shafi'i passed away, the great Imam Shafi'i, the scholar, right? What did she say? She said, may Allah have mercy on Imam Shafi'i. He used to perfect his wudu. He used to perfect his wudu. May Allah have mercy on Imam Shafi'i. He was someone who perfected his wudu. And these are the small things that count. If we do the small things right, everything else will take care of itself. So the first step, practical step that we can all take for, we can all take in terms of perfecting our salah is perfecting our wudu. And wudu is the key to salah. And without the key, the door is not going to be open. Having presence of heart in our wudu. The next step that we can take in perfecting our prayers inwardly and outwardly is praying the sunnahs praying the sunnahs or the recommended prayers before the actual obligatory prayers. And one of the wisdoms of praying the sunnahs before the prayers is that they prepare our hearts for the obligatory prayers. Right? Any thoughts that you might have, you have them in your sunnah, and when you pray your obligatory prayer, you're prepared for the obligatory prayer. So that's one of the wisdoms of the sunnah prayers is that they prepare you for the fired prayers, the five time fired prayers. Another practical step that we can take in perfecting our prayer is praying them as if it's our last prayer. Right? Keeping to mind or bringing to mind that this could be my last prayer or what if this was my last prayer. Imagine you were told that you only have 24 hours to live, you only have a certain amount of time to live. What would you do different? And of course one of the things that you would do different is that you would pray properly. You would turn to Allah with a full heart. So before we pray, we should keep in mind that what if this was my last prayer and pray each prayer 
as if it was our last prayer. The next thing that we can do, and that this is not, it's recommended, it's a good thing to do, so mention this, is that you can recite Surah Al-Nas before you start the prayer. It's not necessarily directly from the Sunnah, but the scholars mention it's a good thing to do, is that you recite Surah Al-Nas, Surah Al-Nas, because that helps you with the Minshah al waswas al khannas So the waswas that you might have, is that you recite Surah Al-Nas to deflect those waswas, those whisperings in your heart. And finally, another thing that we can do, is one of my teachers, he mentioned this, and he said that when you pray, just know that you're talking to Allah. Just stand up and make it personal. That you're talking to Allah. Don't get caught up with just the routines and the rituals. Know that the essence of the prayer is that you're in conversation with Allah. So keep that in mind. So that's the second aspect of the prayer, the inward, the soul of the prayer. The third aspect, as we mentioned, is the higher objectives of the prayer. Is that what is the higher objectives of the prayer? And as we mentioned, right, the prayer prevents from fahsha wa munkar, from indecency and wrong actions. And Allah says in Surah Tawbah and Surah Taha is that waqimu salat and dhikri is that establish the prayer for my remembrance. So the wisdom, one of the wisdoms of the prayer is that is to keep us aware throughout our day. Right? Keep us aware, little reminders here and there of what's important for us as Muslims. Little reminders here and there to remember Allah. Right? To remember your, your reality. And there's one more one more higher objective that the scholars mention, Shah Wali Allah he mentioned this. He says that one of the wisdoms or the secrets of the prayer is that it actually prepares the person for the act, the wit, the, 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 for the vision, the beatific vision of Allah, seeing Allah in the akhirah. Is that the more strong a person's prayer is, is that the more clear his vision will be. That they mention that's based on a hadith. Shamali Allah mentions that. So may Allah give us the enabling grace and may Allah make us amongst those who perfect their prayers and may Allah strengthen us in our faith and may Allah strengthen us in our prayers and may Allah accept us and may Allah make our children from amongst those who establish the prayer يا أيها إن الله وملائكته يصلون على النبي يا أيها الذين آمنوا صلوا عليه وسلموا تسليما اللهم صل وسلم على سيدنا محمد عبدك رسولك النبي الأمي وعلى آل سيدنا محمد وزواجه وذريته كما صليت على سيدنا إبراهيم وعلى آل سيدنا إبراهيم وبارك على سيدنا محمد العبد رسولك النبي الأمي وعلى آل سيدنا محمد وزواجه وذريته كما باركت على سيدنا إبراهيم وعلى آل سيدنا إبراهيم في العالمين إنك حميد مجيد اللهم عز الإسلام وصور المسلمين اللهم عز الإسلام وصور المسلمين اللهم عز الإسلام وصور المسلمين اللهم هيئ لهذه الأمة أمرا رشدا يعز فيه وليدك ويذل فيه عدوك ويعمل فيه بطاعتك ويضاءك يا رب العالمين اللهم كن إخواننا المسلمين في مشارك المظاهر وانصرهم وامدودهم بمزيد عناية ورعاية ونصر وتأييد وتوفيق منك يا أرحم الراحمين يا أرحم الراحمين يا أرحم الراحمين وقيم الصلاة